continuing the Duquesne Center for Legal Information speaker series with today's conversation with Professor Bruce Lederitz, who is Adrian Van Van Kahn, Endowed Chair and Scholarly Expert and Professor of Law at Duquesne Klein School of Law. Welcome, Bruce. Welcome, Donna. If I may. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Every year, I would like to say a few things that are going to precede our first question. So every year, the Wisconsin Law Review holds a competition to host its annual symposium. And law professors across the country submit proposals for that year's theme. The winning submission for the October 2022 symposium was yours, Bruce. Perhaps because it addressed a matter on many, many people's minds, controlling the Supreme Court now and far into the future. Your presentation focused on the question of is there a future for American law? And like our conversation today, we recently wrote for the Pennsylvania Capital Star that meaningful debate is only possible if there is a common framework. When you talk about the future of the American law, you underscore the agreement about the common good. And um, I would like to applaud you and mention that you share a view of the law with Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And you firmly believe the arc of the moral universe, the law, bends towards justice, including law. There is very little that I can add to that. So on this note, I would like to welcome you again and start with the first question. Okay, but I, I have to mention my co-host for the Wisconsin Symposium, Eric Siegel of Georgia State University. Thank you. Okay. So how would you like to introduce yourself I've been thinking about that. Um, obviously, law professor. I mean, I've been a law professor since 1980. That's a lo very long time here, here at, at Duquesne. Not only am I the oldest law professor in the building, I'm older than the building. Yes, but uh, your work speaks about youthfulness. Oh, sorry, thank you. I'll tell my uh, my primary care physician. <laughs> um, so, so you have to have a law professor. And the other way, I think. Um, that you have to be introduced as uh, post-Jewish. That's a term that Tom um, uh, Krattenmaker, who's a, a secular writer for USA Today and, and uh, Only Sky website, um, he attached that to me. Um, I've, I've, I've actually used it. I, he dredged it up from something I'd written I'd forgotten. But post-Jewish is a very good term for me because I was raised in Judaism and actually in Orthodox Judaism, um, which I have now left. But of course, it leaves its imprint. So I think you 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 cannot understand my work except as somebody who had been very very religious. This so post Jewish law professor. This is very thoughtful what you are saying because it goes to identity. We are in February in the Black History Month, and it's very meaningful that you actually added the uh, upbringing because your upbringing, because uh, I think everything we read about you is so profound. Everything you write is so profound. And you're absolutely right. It has something to do with your upbringing. So being transparent about that, I want to applaud you. And I think it's, it's going to help people further understand your work when they read it. Oh yeah, no, I don't think there's any question, but it's a limit too, because um, a lot of my work involves this increasingly secular culture and I identify as a secular person but a lot of the secularists today never had the experience I did with organized religion so there's a limit to how I can speak to that group that that's a group in the future that my work may not speak to for that reason so we'll I, see exactly I beg to differ because your focus on the common good it will always keep you relevant. Well, you know, it's funny because uh, I, I I feel that I emphasized the common good before a Professor Vermeul at uh, Harvard invented common good constitutionalism, which is now so controversial. But it is, in fact, the same problem. Um, even though I have political differences with him, it's it, the, the critics from right, right and left of common good constitutionalism really are criticizing the idea of objective, substantive, moral values, and something about human nature and the nature of the universe being fixed, something about essence. 
and uh, that's rejected today. So to that extent, he and I are really on the same page and it's common, it's common good by all means. I'm going to be on that page, although I come from a very Marxian background and essentialist right. talk is something that we engage in that group. Yes, Marxists are also uh, substantive moralists. Yes. So um, what inspires you to write? This is our second question. Yes, well, here the stu students have to understand um, my relationship with Robert Taylor. Robert Taylor, who retired from here, from a client who came law school uh, some years ago. But both of us came at the same time in 1980. We were well, part of a group of four at, at that time over who to hire. And um, there was a, a group that wanted Duquesne graduates, a group that wanted outside people. Um, and Robert was a Duquesne graduate, but they didn't know what they were getting. <laughs> they, they, he, was, he, he, he was a Protestant minister. He had uh, graduated uh, uh, from the seminary here in Pittsburgh. He had studied with Karl Barth in, in uh, Austria. Um, he spoke German, spoke and read German, um, uh, spoken, uh, at least read Hebrew and Greek, of course, was uh, conversant with Aramaic. I mean, it was just, you know, a really, really talented and educated and thoughtful person. And um, so <laughs> but anyway, he was the Duquesne grad. And um, I was living in Pittsburgh, but had gra graduated from Yale Law School. So I was acceptable. And so the compromise was, since I was from Pittsburgh, even though I didn't graduate from Duquesne, it was okay. Uh, so in some sense, Robert and I, um, we balanced each other, but we became extremely close. And uh, Robert um, really has led me in, in law and in learning ever since. I often tell the story, all the faculty have heard it, but uh, students haven't heard it, that when we were hired in 1980, um, I, I was teaching con law. Robert was given terrible courses to teach the worst, the worst they, they could, they could give because the Dean didn't want him. And also the Dean made a point of paying him slightly less than I was paid, even though we both came in at the same time, which was later corrected, of course, but, um, it was all, you know, just part of this fighting that we were doing, the school was doing at that time. So I was teaching con law. I got the, the choice course. And my first class was, of course, Marbury versus Madison. So Robert and I were sitting on a bench overlooking the Mon River at that. That was before the jail was built. So you could still overlook the Mon River. And um, Robert said, well, why don't you tell me what's in your first lecture? And I gave him my first lecture. I was very proud of it. Marbury versus Madison. It's every con law class's first lecture. When I finished, Robert said more in amazement then as criticism, he said, you don't actually know anything about what you're talking about, do you? And what he meant was, and he was surprised that I could have such a pedigree, Georgetown School of Foreign Service, Yale Law School, but I didn't know anything about the rights tradition that I was talking about. I didn't know anything about its history. I didn't know anything about uh, classic liberalism. I didn't know anything about European thought, uh, European um, philosophy. I didn't know anything about anything. It was obvious that I was just repeating things I'd been told. Now, I did, think, did not accept this. I did not take this in a very good spirit at the time. I, I refused to accept it too. Um, so at the next, the next uh, fall, there was a conference at Yale. The, the, school, the conference on critical legal studies was uh, going to debate the conventional legal theorists of the Yale Law School. And I went up to hear this debate. I knew that my teachers would do fine um, against these neo-Marxists. And I came back completely stricken, shaken. I wasn't convinced by Marxist thought, but my teachers had nothing to say. They were completely empty. They did not know what they were talking about. And I went to Robert and said, okay, teach me something. And that began um, a, uh, uh, an unfolding relationship that has lasted to this day. Now that, you know, Robert's now retired, but ap right after this interview, I will go visit him and we're, we're reading now. And what are you reading? We're, we're reading a book called um, Reality. Um, I, I, don't know, I don't know this book. We're, we were reading uh, the two volumes set by uh, Ian McClendon or whatever, um, the, 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 trouble, the, the Problem with Things, 
Yes, I, I, I haven't read it. Um, but anyway, uh, almost everything I know about anything is a misunderstanding of something Robert has said. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's lovely. And it's wonderful. And if students want to know more about that, I wrote a, a piece for the Duquesne for the Duquesne Law Review when Robert retired, talking about some of the things he had done. He provided amazing intellectual leadership for the law school while he was here. He was the heart and soul of this law school while he was here. This is an additional question. So do you think you're providing that? I don't know that you're allowed to uh, use <laughs> 10 questions. I, I've paid a certain amount to answer questions. So, you know, 10, do I think I'm providing what? What Robert you're just providing? No, can't. I mean, I feel sorry for my students. I got the law and philosophy class uh, when Robert retired. And I know that you're very much beloved. Respected. Well, regardless, but it's not the same as when Robert taught it. It's not the same at all. No, Robert, Robert never taught the same class twice. Never. Um, he, I did learn that from him. Uh, I learned, and it was bad for my career in law, because Robert's view was once you thought a thought, well, then you leave that behind. That's thought. And you move on, you move yes, on yes. and you develop. Yes. Whereas the only way you make any headway in law is to hammer the same point over and over and over again for 20 years. So I, I did not do that. And so I don't have much of a reputation. My reputation in American law only began uh, in 2015. And it only began because of um, Donald Trump. So I'll, I'll explain more about that later. Yes, yes. Yes, that's a Now the other um, the other uh, inspiration is that um, something that happened uh, over a long period of time after I became a law professor, I began to notice something very troubling. That every time I had a serious discussion with someone, at some point it didn't matter who they were, it didn't matter what their background was. At some point they would say, "Well, that that's just your opinion." And that kind of relativism or nihilism, popular relativism or nihilism, um, troubled me tremendously because I, I, I thought that must eventually lead to breakdown of all institutions, which it has. So all of my writing has really been in a way a response to that problem. That is very, very telling because um... In all your work, and I have to say that um, when I interviewed for this position, I, I did uh, uh, read Bruce's uh, work that was available at that time. And it seemed uh, obvious that um, you are answering questions that weren't obvious in the page, but they were obvious in the depth of the treatment of the issue that you raised. So it was obvious that you've really been thinking about how to preserve the rule of law or the direction of the rule of law or what it means to have a democracy in America for a very long time. For a very long time. So whether you pose that question and answer it, it was obvious that you are a true constitutional scholar. So I'm very happy to, to have it here today. Well, thank you. I'm going to move on to the third okay, question. The third question, yes. Who are your favorite legal writers? Right. Well, um, here, more conventional answer. So um, probably um, Hilary Putnam. Now, Hilary Putnam is a philosopher, but he was very close to American legal thinking <laughs> during his lifetime. Hilary Putnam um, wrote about realism, moral realism, uh, common sense or, or limited realism. He tried to find a pathway between the traditional uh, belief in God on the one hand and Richard Wordy's no mirror of nature on the other. I, I don't know whether he succeeded, but that task has always inspired me. And a lot of um, his observations I've applied in my um, own legal thought and my thinking about law. So there's one, Hilary Putnam. Second, of course, um, Justice John Harlan and his Poe descent. It's very rare for me to write a law review article in which I don't refer to his Poe descent about the nature of substantive due process, the nature of the judicial task, the nature of the identification of values, 
the objectivity of values, the relationship of the court to the American people. Um, I think he he was he in in many ways is our quintessential justice, more John Holmes. Oh, much more than Holmes, the skeptic. You know, Holmes did some good things. He did a lot of damage too. That is um, true. Uh, and and Charles Black, my teacher oh. at Yale. Um, Charles Black uh, wrote uh, a short piece called Law as an Art. And I, it was a very important piece to me, although I now think of law more as a science, but I think of science as an art. Um, so th there's, there's that. He wrote The People in the Court. Um, I'm not familiar. Thank you. Well, I mean, this is all the tradition. I, I spoke about this at Wisconsin. This, these are the traditional sources yes. that are now uh, completely uh, unrecognized. So, you know, when I went to law school, the hard fuller debate about pos legal positivism and natural law, you could not have graduated from law school in 1977 when I graduated without having some exposure to the hard fuller debate. And that's not, and when I teach it now in law and philosophy, students have never heard of law before or HLA Harden. You know, we think that it's philosophy to argue about originalism. That's not philosophy. I mean, that's just interpretive method. It rests on a philosophy. Correct. We can always go to a philosophical point of view perspective if we want to be more comprehensive and we want to think about the bigger picture. But what you are saying, could it be that, in fact, in our legal education today, there is, um, there is a focus on what we produce in terms of employment? So we produce people who are able to become employed. Oh, yes. Rather than produce thinkers who have an idea of the bigger picture of the society and where law fits in this puzzle, law as a social, societal no, construct. Absolutely. But I know what Charles Black would say in answer to your question. Please. Charles Black would have said, well, now there, there can't really be a, um, he was from Texas. <laughs> there can't really be a, um, some kind of gap between thinking and earning a living, surely. I hope we can prove him right. Yeah, for, yes. yes. So thank you so much. We are moving forward with uh, what piece of your scholarship would you like to talk about today? And for, for the students and anybody who is going to watch us on YouTube or from Duquesne Common, uh, Digital Commons, uh, I have lined up uh, only the books, not more of your law review scholarship, and especially your column that you are writing as a, what type of journalist do you consider yourself? Well, I, I think of myself as a, um, a political commentator, okay. uh, but not a politicized co commentator. Yeah, absolutely. And I hope that um, I'm able, and, I, and I've learned a lot from my editor at the Pennsylvania Cap Capital Star, John Meisick, I've learned a lot about how to how to write to people, how to um, influence the public, um, because Charles Black always said, you, in writing for constitutional commentary, you're always writing for the public because it's the it's the American people's constitution, and therefore all of our thinking should be something that a person could read with an average education. We should always be writing for the public. Great and great constitutional scholars know that. Um, and, and they do it. Um, and, and that's what I try to do in that column. And uh, it's, it's very helpful. But I did want to talk about my books, as a matter of fact, Thank you. because um, as Gene Mazo says, my good friend Gene Mazo, now Gene Mazo is a person who shh, is coming here next year. We have not announced that yet, but he will be, he's visiting at Rutgers this year and he'll be joining our faculty next year. Gene is a longtime friend and he's a, a brilliant election law uh, scholar and a great teacher. So we're very lucky to be getting him. But Gene says, law professors should only write books. He says, there are bookstores. There are no article stores. <laughs> so um, so uh, yes, I, I, I think that my, my books are much more important in the long run than anything I've written in a law review article. And uh, there's no great divide between these books and my law review articles anyway. That, that is true, but um, um, I, I just want to follow up with a smaller question. You are saying that because you are a tenured faculty member. Do you think you would have given the same answer 
if you hadn't been tenured, that your books are more important than your law review article? No, no. I mean, I would have done the same thing. I, I, I would have done what I did uh, when I was uh, not tenured, which is I would have written law review articles, which is how I got tenured. Um, but in the but in the long run, um, I think the books are much more important. You you know to get tenure, you 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 show you demonstrate the the mastery of conventional legal thinking. It's not it's not the place for experimentation, and it's like um, it's it's like any art or, or any skill. First, you show that you've mastered it, and then you can move off from it. And so our in our first six years, all the all law professors try to show they can teach the conventional materials, they can write conventionally in a way that the academy understands and accepts, and be part of the conversation in the ordinary sense. And then we hope over time our faculty develop beyond that. But you know, we all have to master those first things. Thank you. Amazing advice that we just received right now. Well, that's okay, because if you didn't do it, you wouldn't get tenure, so that's that. <laughs> um, so uh, what piece of your scholarship would you like to... Well, no, I, I'm actually going to introduce them all. Excellent. It, I mean, okay. it's very, it's, it, I wrote three of these books in a, in a white heat in a six-year period. Um, that is remarkable. It is, it is remarkable. I had a, a lot to say. So... Um, Beginning in 2007 with American religious democracy coming to terms with the end of secular politics, this was my attack on Rawlsian thinking. I mean, I, in, two, in the 2004 presidential election, I watched as uh, President Bush marshaled religious voters and by, by, by some scandalous things like having putting on the ballot uh, so public questions that voters had to come out for, marriages should be limited to a man and a woman, things like that. They tried to get the religious right out to vote, and they and they succeeded. They succeeded brilliantly. Um, and what I wrote in this book was that the wall of separation is over. You know, I um, um, it's probably the the, the the most prescient thing I wrote. This is back in two thousand seven, and I wrote metaphorical walls do not fall as dramatically as physical ones. So it will be hard to name a moment of which one could say before the wall of separation between church and state was standing. Afterwards, it was gone. In popular understanding, the wall is largely down. In the courts, the wall is breaking apart. In academia, the wall is only starting to fall. This book is partly a chronicle of the fall. Mostly, it's a bridge to the post-fall world. So that was prescient. That was, a, of course, it was already true in 2007, but it only became more and more and more true. But Rawls had, had tried to convince people of a couple of things that were uh, horrible. He tried to, I mean, and John Rawls was all the rage. A theory of Justice came out in 1971. It, 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 that's what everybody was reading in law school when I was in law school. But um, he tried to convince people, first of all, that, that conflict cannot be engaged in, in a democratic polity, disagreement, that you need to make arguments that everybody can accept. Yes. And that, um, that what you call public reason. And he assumed that our starting points were, were irreconcilable. I don't, I don't accept that premise at all. Out of our common humanity, I have no reason to accept that premise. So when, when Dr. King uh, said the arc of the moral universe is long, but he bends toward justice, he, he was talking about a justice that would be recognized by all persons of good faith. Absolutely. And um, so he would he would say to Rawls, nobody should worry about conflict. That's not our problem. Our problem is, is we're not going to go to war. We're going to discuss. We're going to we're going to engage in democratic discourse. Um, I want to come back to the mission statement of this law school, which is unique in all of American law. That's true. It promotes democratic discourse. Yes. And that's what the answer is. Not, But what Rawls tried to do was to say to religious people, you can't speak out of your religious tradition in the public square. And they came out and voted and said, yes, we can. You don't control what we can say. And that's that's why I say this is the end of secular politics. And um, it, it was the end of the idea. And of course, now we, we, we consider the idea of secular politics ridiculous because Unfortunately. politics and, and religion are very closely intertwined. Anyway, so that was uh, 2007 and then in uh, 2009, 
my first attempt uh, at secularism, how it's secularism. I wrote this book on a, while I was on sabbatical from the law school. My mother was dying at the time, and I was able to take the time to sit with her and uh, uh, read her parts of the uh, of the book, especially the parts that were critical of her. And um, I wanted to know if I got it right, if I, if I had remembered my childhood correctly. And um, so th that was a, a, a very uh, a deep and wonderful experience to have had the time to actually sit with her as she lay dying. Most people don't have that opportunity. Um, so that was, that's, that's this book. This book was an attempt to define a kind of secularism that would not be like what I was seeing. I was, I, I mean, by this point, I'd already left Judaism and I was seeing people with nothing, with, 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 without any kind of foundation and without any hope for a foundation. It was just sort of popular materialism. You know, life is, life is nothing, then you die. And um, there had to be more. And this was my first attempt to go down that road. Um, and then in, in 2011, church stayed in the crisis in American secularism. The crisis was nihilism. Uh, and uh, my suggestion was that, that religious imagery could be used by government to try to shore up values, that would not be a violation of the separation of church and state in any sense, would not be an establishment of religion. That, you know, God could mean a lot of things and that secularists should not be so fearful of religious imagery, but um, it didn't work. You know, it didn't work. You have, you have another question about what impact these works had, uh, not very much. Well, we'll reach that. Don't, 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 don't be the judge of that. Anyway. Um, but but once 2015 uh, uh, happened, once Brexit happened, once the breakdown could be seen, my work had a very different salience. And suddenly it, it, it seemed I could make the same arguments I'd made before and people were listening. And it was a very big change. Um, I would add, unfortunately, correct? And we are, in a way, unfortunately, right. It would have been better to have been wrong about all this. <laughs> much, much better for everybody yes. if I had been wrong about all this. Absolutely. But uh, I was. It, it turned out to be just as disastrous. In fact, much, much worse than I could have imagined. Um, I knew something bad would happen. But, you know, the idea of a, a Donald Trump attaining the presidency was shocking even to the people who voted for him. <laughs> Um, so uh, recently, during the pandemic, I wrote The Universe is on Our Side, Restoring Faith in American Public Life, which is a much fuller statement of the possibilities of a hallowed secularism. It, our secularism, now we know that we, that we have our starting point. That's our home. That's our new religious uh, stance, if you will. And um, the, the and I learned this from Bernard Lonergan, the great Canadian theologian, who asked the question, is the universe on our side? He thought, that's the question you ask. If you are a skeptical culture, start there. And uh, that's where I start the book. Is the universe on our side? Because I, I attribute the breakdown that we're seeing to the death of God and traditional religion. But we haven't come up with our alternative. We haven't even thought that there needed to be an alternative. We just, you know, secularism just thought, well, it, it, when people stop believing in ridiculous things like religion, everything will be fine. Turns out not to be the case. I would like to um, to thank you for this um, um, introduction that was uh, so illuminating, uh, the, the brief. And um, listening to you, um, I couldn't stop thinking about uh, the work of um, a politician and activist and um, um, poet, Aimé Césaire, who wrote about the Haitian Revolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I always uh, wonder how important is it to have a storytelling talent, which is obvious you have in expressing your most complex views. This is off script, this question. Oh. How important, how what would have become of Bruce Ledowitz without this 
storytelling come? Well, I learned about story from the book Ishmael, which is one that all the students in my philosophy of law class read. Uh, it's a fable. Um, it's so important to me uh, that my, my wife, Pat, who took the course, um, after she encountered the book, she paid young people $10 to read it. Not, not the students who were assigned it, but um, she, would, she would. She would go around giving, saying to people, you need to read this book. Here's $10. And um, in this book by, by, uh, by Quinn, uh, Daniel Quinn, th th there's a gorilla. And, and who's I'm the teacher? I have to. Okay. It, I, I will read it without the ten dollars. Promise. Please tell that. Okay. Although she'll send me the ten dollars anyway. But um, so the gorilla is a teacher, and teaches captivity naturally, uh, and um, you know has tele telepathic powers. And the gorilla asks the student, who's never named. This, this book is is an exchange between the student and the uh, gorilla teacher. Um, why did Hitler succeed? And the student says, of course, by terror. And the, the, the teacher says, well, you, you must never have seen the newsreels of the, um, the absolute adoration the German people had for Adolf Hitler. How? I mean, it was all nonsense. How could? And the answer is because Adolf Hitler had a story. He could explain how things came to be the way that they were. And you cannot engage um, anything deep and meaningful without a story of how things came to be this way. Thank you. Uh, it's very thoughtful. And I, I, I would like to see how you address that position with the current originalism on the Supreme Court. I think they seem to have a story, hopefully. You're going to write a much better story. Well, there's, I mean, there's, their story is that um, that the uh, the only way you can interpret a legal text or really anything is according to the meaning that it had at the time it was written. They have reasons for that as a theory of language, correct? Um, so that they they consider the fixity thesis necessary. Um, we have to agree on what the text is. So if the use of a word has changed radically in 200 years, we have to understand what the word meant at the time it was written, or we can't understand the text at all. And in that regard, they are, of course, right. Yes. So um, uh, the, that is uh, necessary. And, and they feel that a judge, that this is not general language interpretation, but a judge should be limited to interpreting the text as that what in terms of what that term meant at the time in its original public meaning. And if you don't do that, then the judge is making up the law because the law that was enacted, whether it's a contract or a statute or the constitution, is the language commonly understood at the time it was enacted. And in a general sense, they've succeeded because that's such an attractive theory. What it leaves out is that the framers um, did not exactly accept it. They were not legal positivists. And so the framers thought, for one thing, that they were fundamental rights that they had forgotten about or didn't know about. And so they, they, they wrote the Ninth Amendment to say, if we left anything important out, like parental rights, or some people would say abortion, some people would say the life of the unborn. If we left something out, we'll fix it. Because they were natural rights thinkers. They didn't think that they were the last word in that regard. And they also did not think that people had rights because they were written down in the Constitution. So to limit rights by what's written in the Constitution is completely inconsistent with their whole understanding. And a lot of originalists actually understand that. Originalism really is just a way to keep wayward liberal judges from making stuff up. And that's not a bad idea. Absolutely. But I think they're also missing the philosophical issue with law, that law is a construct to govern reality with an eye for the future, not reality with an eye for the past. Oh, no, Scalia would disagree with that. Right. Scalia would absolutely say no. It is a philosophical disagreement. It is, it is uh, meant to keep uh, uh, out social rot. We don't need law. We have democracy to take care of the future. We don't need law for that. We, we need law to protect us from the rot. 
But the, the other mistake that originalism makes in my view is the this idea they also thought they did not know what freedom of speech meant. Yes. They also thought they did not exhaust what was a reasonable warrant. They also or probable cause. They they thought we might improve Absolutely. on our on their understanding of cruelty, for example. Absolutely. So you know, in, in 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 many ways, you cannot be an originalist and be faithful to the framers. That is wonderful. On that note, we are moving forward. Okay, we are moving forward. So, um, what are the main ideas behind your scholarship, in addition to what we have discussed? Well, actually, what happened was um, they it crystallized in the crisis. So, um, the main idea was breakdown. And so that that became the main focus. Now I had there were other parts of my scholarship, you know. I had written um, to get the tenure, for example. I'd written a lot about the death penalty. I ran a death penalty clinic here from 1981 to 1993. Students helped me defend death penalty cases in court. Um, and so you know there there was a, there was that uh, there was a lot of writing about state constitutional law. I mean, I have a whole other career in criticizing the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, for example, um, uh, over the years, over pay raises and all sorts of things. And most of my public persona is really known through that work. Uh, and, and when people meet me, they that's what they've seen, you know, the kind of public fights over uh, Pennsylvania government. But increasingly, after 2015, the main idea was breakdown. Correct, but I would like to correct that the, uh potential misperception, the breakdown, you are looking at it from the point of view of building up a bridge. Oh, yes. Story. So you are not someone who is just looking and um, describing whatever it is. You have a normative and critical perspective. Yes, that's absolutely true. I, want, I would like to do something about the breakdown. And you are doing through your writing. Right. That's the hope. But in any event, that is the main idea, nevertheless, is breakdown. Because... It is a breakdown that got everybody's attention. And so probably the, the article I've written that's best known is the five days in June when values died in American law, um, which was an observation I made that back in 1992, in a five-day period, every justice on the court had joined one of two opinions. It was either the Kennedy majority opinion in Lee versus Weissman or the Scalia dissent in the Casey abortion case. Both opinions, uh, two different cases, five days apart, uh, asserted that values were just human constructs. And this was nihilism coming home to roost on the U.S. Supreme Court in 1992. And everything that happened after that was an unfolding from that already broken down system. So today, three decades later. Yes. What can you say looking at that? Well, I could say that it's it's all true. Nothing has changed. You know, the, there is still an unwillingness in law to put law on sustainable foundations. Law and democracy must be put on a sustainable foundation. That's true in an environmental sense, in a cosmological sense. It's true, of course, in a moral sense, sense of objective values. Uh, nihilism is not an, uh, a foundation. And foundationlessness is not a foundation. Now, Martin Heidegger uh, wrote about foundationlessness, but he didn't mean nihilism. No. And, um, and um, it, that's a misunderstanding. So uh, nihilism is not our future. No. We won't have a future. Exactly. Thank you. Um, we are going with question number six. What does it add to the existing body of literature in this field, your scholarship? And we talked about it and my view, I think different than yours. I think it adds a lot because it has this perspective of optimism. Oh yes, that no, people have, have mentioned that. I'm, I'm not depressed. No, and that's um, wonderful. You know, I believe in the future, but this could very well be my religious upbringing. You know, I, I don't think the universe is finished with us yet. I think there's much more to come. Um, uh, no, I have vi a very great faith in the future. I think uh, the, the problems that we're having today are uh, solvable. And I don't even think they're as serious as we think they are. 
although climate change is very, very, very serious, but at least we know what to do about it. If uh, we decide to do something. If we decide to do something. Um, but uh, fascism in the 1930s was much more a dreadful um, because there was, there was a point at which um, the whole world was think thinking seriously, is liberal democracy a good idea? And we talk about that, but we don't really mean it. Um, Harper's Magazine just had a four part discussion. Is liberalism worth saving? Um, and and all of the people who were arguing about it were actually liberals. So, I mean, you know, what, it's very different. No one's arguing for fascism. And, um, and now one party rule, as usual, has shown itself to be absurd in China and Russia's recent um, disastrous steps. So uh, for all our problems, uh, we can have a lot of confidence in our system. It's taken us a long way and it's given us many advantages and we've enjoyed its fruits. Absolutely, you, you mentioned sustainability and uh, I think that is the key. If we could understand that everything that sounds radical like the climate change, if we were to understand that it's a matter of sustainability, that's why we're trying to fight the negative impact of climate change in order to preserve what we have right. and the values that we have. Right. And, um, you know, uh, there are limits. And, and this is one of the one of the uh, unfortunate features of Western civilization. Tom Berry, the great um, echo theologian, um, who we also talk about in philosophy of law. But Tom Berry talked about the rage in Western civilization against limits of any kind. And Ishmael is about that, too. Um, this is, it's, it's, it's absurd. There are limits. There are limits to growth. There are limits to inputs. There are limits to uh, what you can do. And our desire to live outside all limit is uh, a, a misunderstanding of liberalism and the liberal tradition. Maybe a little bit of pollination with Marxian thought would help because liberty in the Marxian thought is understanding the limit. That's right. That's uh, absolutely true. Um, but you know, Marx has had their own problems of about course, of the course. beautiful future. <laughs> of, of course, but that was because it was co-opted by those countries with one party system. That's right. That's absolutely true. Yes. Um, but anyway, I have confidence in the future because I, I do think that the system has proved very resilient and um, and good. And so I think that, um, that we can look forward with hope um, and our job is to talk to people that we don't agree with. Yes. Okay, on this note, we are moving forward. What does it add to the existing body of literature? In this? Oh, we, we just mentioned that. How do you think um, being, being uh, I'm going to give you a label, successful writer. How did it help being a successful writer, your teaching and scholarship, legal scholarship? Well, in terms of teaching, the... Um, the effect was this. I, I was criticized earlier. Robert criticized me for this. Um, always, always walk going up to the edge and then hiding my myself, thinking that that's what a good teacher does. A good teacher just presents the material or whatever. And um, writing brought me out, brought me, brought my story out, my my commitments out on the table, so that. I don't think anybody would say that anymore. Now, obviously, the classroom has to be a place that's open um, to, to various perspectives. And even though my basic uh, approach is lecture, I think my students would all say that I do a very good job of bringing in all the disparate voices about it, on, on any particular issue. But I also make it clear what my voice is, which I did not do before. So writing certainly had that effect. Um, I'm not recommending that for everybody because very often it's dreadful um, because all you hear is the faculty member's opinion about everything and you don't get any other, anything else. And that's of course uh, not education. Um, but on the other hand, you can also get the professor who either pretends or, or doesn't know that the professor is presenting his or her own views and is presenting them as the law. And that's of course the worst of all. When it is just an opinion. When, when it, well, it's not just an opinion, it's an, an appeal to truth. But I was trying to connect to 
power earlier. Right, but it is, but it is not an acknowledgement that it isn't already the truth. Yes. Yes. So it's a search. It's a yes. process. Now, what are you working on right now? Uh, probably, um, I, I don't know. I mean, it depends on some speaking uh, engagements that I hope to get, which are not, have not come through yet. Uh, but my next immediate project is probably the um, the new American realism. Uh, in American legal tradition, the term realism means almost exactly the opposite of what it means generally. Um, realism normally means that uh, the values are objective in some sense, but um, very um, Kantian. Yes, but very. But in um, uh, the American legal tradition, the realists of the 1950s were actually people who were urging us to be realistic um, about why judges decide what they decide. And so they began to um, present um, biographies, in mm -hmm. a sense, of, of, of judges. And that tradition has a lot to offer. It's certainly fair to say, for example, that conservative judge, judges vote in a conservative way when they can. Um, and it's true. Um, but, it's, but we call that realism. Which is not. Which it's not. And so I, I, I hope to introduce a, a new kind of uh, realism, which is the traditional kind that we're, that we're talking about, Hillary, Hillary Putnam, to bring us back full circle. Some kind of minimal realism that doesn't assume that some side in a case is the truth, but on the other hand, does assume that the arc of the moral universe still long bends toward justice. That there is a truth. That there is a truth. A truth we cannot know fully, but we can know part of. And I think history is a very good guide to what those truths are. Is it possible that uh, you feel um, um, closer to American realism because of the um, criminal law background when you mentioned that you, you defended uh, uh, death penalty cases? You had to hope that there is an objective truth that you can uncover, that you can present to the judge that you can work with. And uh, I'm asking this because another realist whose work I, I uh, read and admired, George Fletcher, who started at Berkeley. Right. And uh, he was very fluent in German philosophy and Kantian philosophy and so forth. And he had a green adult. Oh, no, he was, uh, Fletcher was uh, the maybe the last of the great system builders. Yes. And, and in his case, it was in criminal law. But you also said that you had your clinic about um, the death penalty. Death penalty. Yes. So do you think there is a connection? Oh, I'm sure there is because uh, I, I I wrote um, I, I gave a talk. I, I was for five years the secretary of the National Coalition Against the Death Penalty here in the United States, and um, I gave a talk about the death penalty and the anti-slavery abolitionists. And so the the abolition of slavery has always been a central image or metaphor to me. And a, and a demonstration that truth over time uh, matters. And it's also um, been an example of the fact that, that even though there's disagreement, it doesn't mean that, that you can say nothing about truth. So in the 1850s, there were people who defended slavery as good, and they were wrong. And it's not arrogant to say they were wrong, they were wrong. And um, we can say the same thing about our opponents, even though we're not, we're not entirely right either. Um, but we shouldn't be afraid to say, there's a truth here between us. You know, when we talk about abortion, it doesn't just go on endlessly. And I think that uh, people who are pro-choice should think about the fact that once same-sex marriage was decided, it was over. The American people came to see that that was good, that was just. Once abortion was decided, it was not over. That tells us something, at least about the moral questionableness about abortion, that there's there's something uh, there that is not easily resolved, that is not there in same-sex marriage. This is very profound what you're saying. And uh, I've always had, um, you know, a particular relationship because uh, uh, my very existence is due to the um, criminalization of abortion in Romania. Ah. So um, it is a very, you know, personal attitude. At the same time, I'm a staunch opponent because of, uh, opponent to anything saying that the state should interfere with my body. 
to the extent that um, that is uh, um, possible. Well, as Scalia said about uh, religious liberty, you know, religious liberty wouldn't be such a problem if they weren't serious competing in the values on both sides. Absolutely. And that's what I'm saying about abortion. I don't think that's true about same-sex marriage, no. but I think it is true about abortion. Yes, because there are many, many political values. Like, for example, in, in Romania, they needed more people to work. The workforce had to, you know, to, to grow and create the new person. So there are many public values. So I understand the value in it. And I understand that, uh, you know, as human beings, I'm not um, telling men what they have to do. So by the same token, we should treat all individuals in the same way. So if the state doesn't interfere with what a man should be, why should the state of woman? No way. We are defining woman. If someone is pregnant, we have to bring it to fruition. So you, you're absolutely right. It's complicated. And as long as we can see the reason for the debate, but we know that there is a truth. Yes, and we will, some, I, I believe we will come to that truth. Um, or we will fudge it. In other words, we've also learned a great deal yes. in, in very recent years about the humanity of the unborn child, which we, you know, of course, didn't know. The Bible doesn't know anything about that. Um, and, and, and yet, everything you've said about women is also true. Um, so wherever we end up, it's not going to be a clean decision. Uh, it could be closer, however, than either um, you know, there's nothing there, or, or we can tell women anything we want. You know, he, both of those positions are going to be rejected. Yes, because it has that uh, political value. If the unborn child has some value for the state as a born, it should continue to have value once it's born. And so far, we haven't seen anything. Free daycare, free health care. Right, that's the old canard. Exactly. It says, so, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan thought life began at Conception and ended at birth. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So if we can move past that, I think we are going to make huge progress in this area. Thank you. Um, so we know what you are working on right now. What would you like to work on? No, the, what I will be working on, and, and it will be the, my last project of my life, um, it will be building secular civilization. The secularism in America and, and this is going to be a worldwide secular civilization, but I think it will be influenced by the particular religious traditions out of which it comes. So secularism influenced by Buddhism will be different from secularism influenced by Christian thought in the West. Or Judeo-Christian Judaism. Or Judeo or, uh, Judeo -Christian thought. Judeo -Christian. Um, but I do think there will be worldwide secular civilization because the, um, our religions have not managed to solve the riddle of supernaturalism. And I think that um, supernaturalism, which is present in all of our major religions, is not uh, going to be persuasive or credible in the future. And so that and that's uh, was the reason that I broke with uh, Judaism, for example. So I, I think that the secular civilization unfolds because of that problem. Religion declines because of that problem, if, if not always in numbers, I think in numbers, too, but if not always in numbers, in creativity. So this is not the golden age of any uh, in, uh, worldwide religion today uh, because they've all been sapped by this problem, which is extremely hard for them to deal with because they have imagery from you know earlier times, pre-scientific times. And so they've all had a very hard time coming to terms with this. And I, I, I don't think the resolution is going to be easy. But in any event, so this worldwide secular civilization, though, has a choice to make, and it's the choice I begin to talk about in the in, in the universes on our side between a, a a secularism of the no and a secularism of the yes. There's a the all organized secularism in the West today is materialistic, relativistic, and really nihilistic, and this is all the groups and the websites and you know all the criticism of religion comes out of this uh, materialism, which is passe scientifically. It is, and if we want a sustainability project, we have to 
or they have to move past this right. materialistic people, lifestyle. People cannot. Well, lifestyles. Oh, yes. Um, but you're you're talking about treating nature as an independent value. Well, you know that's hard to do if you say, no, we're just things. We're just they're just forces and matter, and matter is dead. And we can do what we want. No, no, that that is not a sustainable future for secularism. A secularism needs to come to terms with matter. Matter is not lifeless. Matter has its own claims. It has a kind of intelligence. It's the source of life. The universe is on our side. It's brought us forth. We we owe it ludicrous. We hate to talk about that, but we do. And it, and it's not just our, our infinitely manipulable plaything. And it's not just out there. It's also in here and between us. So um, I'm thinking about a very different kind of secularism. And it brings me right back to Howard's secularism, the book in which I started on this path. Um, that'll be the completion of it somehow. I am. I'm a believer. Oh, here we go. Yes. So I, I've been before with this discussion, but absolutely, I think um, it's a project that is worth undertaking. And uh, I think you've been working on it for the last um, 40 years. No, yeah, well, maybe, but uh, you think I've made more progress then. But then in any event, <laughs> um, I, what I, is 40 years in? The I, think, of your I think that we can uh, uh, safely predict that I will not be working on it for the next 40 years. I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know. So let's not predict anything because you said it's quite, Yogi Berra said, it's quite difficult to predict the future, isn't it? Yeah, right. It's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> so let's not go there. So the last question is, what would you like to share with your student as a final thought? Well, this is the final thought. I'm going to read from the mission statement of uh, Klein Duquesne. Klein School of Law at Duquesne University educates lawyers to excel in the ethical practice of law. We certainly aim to do that. To preserve the highest ideals of our profession, we certainly aim to do that. And to promote equal justice. And um, already with that, we are uh, breaking ground with most law schools. But then we add to promote equal justice and democratic discourse through leadership, service, and civic engagement. That is the most public-facing uh, mission statement of any law school in America. Um, and we and it absolutely reflects the, the faculty's choice that this is our role. And to fulfill that role, uh, we have to engage in democratic discourse. Now, we do that at, at this law school. Uh, this law school is great about um, being open to argument that, that one does not agree with. We, you know, we don't have safe spaces and all that stuff. We don't fire people um, because they say things we don't like. We're not afraid of ideas. Uh, and that's all good, but it's not enough. We have to practice democratic discourse. We have to practice talking to people that we don't agree with. And I, I, I write um, in, my, in the last book, I have many friends, because I'm on the left. I have many friends who have never had a real discussion with someone who voted for Donald Trump. And they don't think there's anything wrong with that. Mm -hmm. And they're wrong. Yes. That there's no future in that. Absolutely. So to promote democratic discourse, you have to engage in democratic discourse. And that begins with each of us. I, I, I think you have uh, the humility of a true scholar because you engage in dialogue, hoping that you're going to learn something you didn't know before. Yes. So I am I'm very sorry for your friends on the left because they will never know why they lost the um, core white people in this country to Trump because of this lack of dialogue. So not knowing why people are going to choose a particular leader is because you're never wondered or asked. That's right. No, that it's absolutely true. It's not like we couldn't find out. Absolutely. Um, but we've just decided ahead of time. No, they're incorrigibles. Exactly. And that was a mistake. And I, I want to thank you for sharing it with us. And uh, um, th this has been marvelous. And I hope that we have this uh, opportunity again. And um, maybe we can come up with better questions. No, well, maybe maybe the recording didn't work. And we'll have to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> On this note, thank you. I just want to plug in our webinar. 
on, um, on February 23rd, we are going to focus on radical empathy, where we learn how to listen, the, the need to listen from each other. It is very hard to pretend. I, I would never be able to, to be Bruce Ledowitz. I would never be able to, to walk in your shoes or understand uh, uh, your experience, but I can listen to your story. I can learn from your views, from your values, and I can consider what you're saying to open my own mind and try something different next time. So this will be a webinar at noon on February 23rd around uh, Radical Empathy by Professor Terry Gibbons. She will be on our webinar. Excellent, sounds perfect. Thank you. Thank you.